This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today is Sunday, August 23rd, 2020. I welcome you all as we gather for worship at First Presbyterian Church in Smithfield, North Carolina, here in the heart of Johnson County in eastern North Carolina. We prepare ourselves for worship now as we listen to the sounding of the Trinity. We gather today at First Presbyterian Church, and I welcome all of you from near and far, members of our congregation uh, and various households that you join us uh, for this time of coming together in God's Word, but also to those who may be visiting with us today or the stranger stumbling across our virtual gathering of worship for the first time. We welcome all of you and hope you find a meaningful time here with us as we share in God's word to us today. First Presbyterian Church is a community of faith defined by uh, in its mission objectives providing a sound foundation and a place of spiritual formation for our young people, a place of fellowship, and our community outreach as we work in service and mission to our neighbors here in the community and throughout the world but also, we are very much committed to providing a place where individuals can grow spiritually in their discipleship. Especially in today's sermon, we will discern what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and what that means. As I welcome you today, uh, you're invited to join us uh, in our bulletin, which is found on our Facebook page, First Presbyterian Church, Smithville, North Carolina. I would share, uh, I'd like to share with you uh, prayers, uh, requests for two members of our congregation. One is Mr. Sam Faraby, who's facing some treatment soon, and uh, ask for his healing. And also, I would like to ask you to keep in prayer Dr. John Booker uh, and his family. Uh, his sister Betty passed away this week and we'd like to continue to keep that family in our prayers along with all those who may have lost loved ones over the summer who may be grieving and we ask for your prayers for them but also we ask for prayers for many of our young people and our teachers uh, and educators who are all beginning new semesters and new terms under difficult circumstances and I want each of them to know I am thinking and praying for you as you begin new adventures and face new challenges um, that uh, we are all in this together as I've shared with many of you during this difficult time and any difficult time understand we're all pulling in the same direction that we may share good news with one another please join me now in our worship as we read responsibly from our bulletin and I will begin we give you thanks O Lord with all our hearts for your faithful love endures forever we sing your praise O Lord with all our might for your promises speak of goodness to all the earth we place our trust in you O Lord with full confidence for your salvation continues from generation to generation and so we come to worship you, O Lord, and lift up our hearts in praise. Please join me now in our opening prayer for the day. We can share this together. Eternal God, you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And yet you come to us afresh each new day. You breathe new life into what has grown tired and discouraged. You offer healing for what was broken and worn. You restore hope for what seems impossible. You are the source of life and love for us and all your creatures. And so we worship you as creator and Christ and Holy Spirit, one God now and forever and always. Amen and amen. At this time during our service, we come to God, we turn to God to confess our sins, both as a corporate body, a community of faith, but also we share in a time of personal silent confession. Will you join me now? Together we say, merciful and patient God, we confess that we still live in fear and doubt. 
Even though we have been touched by your saving grace, you call us to live with courage and perseverance. Yet we give up too easily and opt for the safer route. You encourage us to be bold in our faith and steadfast in our fight for justice. Yet we remain silent in the face of inequality and violence. Forgive us for all the times we have let you down. Renew our lives through your mercy and grace in Jesus Christ. Amen. And let us now take time to personally seek God's pardon and share our lives with him. Let us pray. In turning to God in faith, we are also assured through Christ of pardon and forgiveness, of reconciliation and healing. Here are the good news. Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and set free by God's generous grace. And forever we sing this song. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. As we gather in worship, and as we turn to God and confess our sins, we share in the Word of God as conveyed to us in scripture and in our community of faith we do this very special sharing with a beginning with time with children and this is a time with our young people and the young at heart to come and we share in the stories of scripture sometimes tied into what our lectionary readings are and that is today last week i talked to everybody about how it, the same idea, the word peace was the example I used, can be spoken in many different ways, that we have different languages that express that concept and people understand it, though it may sound different or look different. Uh, we have to be careful sometimes because we are told not to judge a book by its cover. There may be more going on underneath what we see on the outside. And in today's Old and New Testament, we have that very problem. Actually, I'll call it sort of mistaken identity or an identity crisis about who is this person? You know, what is this person about? And I'm talking specifically in the Old Testament reading is about Moses and in the New Testament about Jesus. Now, in the case of Moses, he was born a slave of the Hebrews, um, God's people, the Israelites in the land of Egypt. He was a foreigner there. And those people were being persecuted. And he was hidden by his mother in the River Nile, but he was found there. And he was given that name, Moses, which is believed to be an Egyptian name, meaning to draw from the water, or a name very similar to it. But it wasn't the identity he was born with, it was a new identity. Now this time of year, normally when we're in classrooms, Teachers and students are all having to learn new names and you know new identities and a new year sometimes is a way to begin ourselves anew and we don't have that opportunity in the same way, especially if we're being schooled at home this year. Um, still, we may be learning new faces. We're certainly learning new technologies. Now, I brought something that I'm going to share with you. Um, this, you say, Joe, this is a little bit early uh, to have this up here, but it's a nativity scene with Joseph and Mary and, of course, baby Jesus. And you see this and you think, I know exactly who those people are. Or maybe we don't. But it's okay to ask and learn who they are. And Jesus actually taught that way. He would ask lots of questions. And one of the questions he asked, even his own followers and disciples, was, who do you say that I am? 
And in today's gospel reading, it's Peter who answers him that says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus gives him the gold star. He gets an A plus for the day, which Peter does not often do. But, and in so doing, Jesus gives him a new name. He gets the name Peter because his name before that was Simon, son of Jonah, and he's given a new name. So for a moment, I'm going to ask you, who gave you your name, your name that people call you by? Is it a nickname? What about your last name? Does that say much about your family? Who do you share that name with? We know that Jesus was born to Mary, and he's often called the son of Joseph and Mary, that we know his parents, we know the community he came from. But people judged him by where he was born, a manger, uh, and that he was the son of a carpenter, and they had ideas about what that meant and who he should be. But they all missed the point. Do you know that in the Bible there are 198 different titles and references to who Jesus really is. It's no wonder we have a Christmas hymn that says, what child is this when we think about the nativity and Jesus being born? People really miss the point and they didn't know who Jesus was. There are titles and I'd like to close with a prayer today that speaks to those titles and ask this Jesus who we know in the church is the Son of God and our Messiah, our Savior and our Deliverer. Together, let us pray. Holy Christ, your Lord, you are the Word made flesh. You are the Son of God. You are the Son of Man, the Son of David, the Lamb of God. Thank you for coming to share your name with us and make us one in your church and in the family of God. Amen. And I thank you all for joining me for that message today because we'll continue that theme in our sermon reflection today. Now, there are two passages um, that are included in today's lectionary. I share with you the Exodus passage, which is the story about G Moses being born. But I'd like to share with you uh, for today's reflection uh, the New Testament lesson I got from the Gospel of Matthew at chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Together, let us listen to God's word to us. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptizer, but others Elijah and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, the rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that this was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, in the hearing of your word, we ask for wisdom, we ask for light to illumine our hearts and minds, to dispel the darkness that clouds our vision and, and creeps in upon us. Illumine our souls that we should see the way and perceive the word made flesh among us in Jesus Christ. And I pray that your servant should be reduced, that the word should be increased for us all. Amen. Indeed, as we read today's story, we can't tell the story of Jesus and the follower of his disciples, but it's no wonder we sing a hymn called, What Child Is This? 
as I shared with our young Christians today, identifying Jesus is a bit of a conundrum. The first encounter or identification of Jesus, at least in as an adult, was from the disciple Nathaniel in the Gospel of John. Hear this. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found out about whom Moses and the law and after the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. And Nathanael said to him, these very famous words, can anything come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And people said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you come to know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. A title. And Jesus affirms that Nathanael knows who he is. In the Gospel of Mark, the oldest of the Gospels, we have what is called the Messianic secret because everywhere Jesus is referred to as the Son of Man. But what is the Son of Man? What child is this, the Son of Mary and of Joseph? What is the Son of Man? Who is the Messiah? Where is the Messiah? You see, Israel was looking for someone to deliver them. They were under Roman occupation. The people were oppressed. The people wanted liberation. They wanted to be able to worship God freely. And they were looking for this deliverer because, as the text says, Moses and the law and then the prophets foretold of one who would come to reign in Israel. Now, I mentioned this Christmas hymn and have the little nativity scene behind me. Uh, there's a song, What Child Is This? And in 1865, over in England, uh, which was not dealing with the Civil War, uh, William Chatterton Dix, who was not an organist, was not a hymn writer, was not a clergyman, was working as the manager of an insurance company. And he was afflicted, as many people in our communities are right now, with a very unexpected and severe illness that resulted in him being bedridden and suffering from very severe depression because he couldn't get up and he couldn't return to the life that he'd known. And I think right now a lot of us can relate to what that means, even if we've not been sick. Things have changed so much. But his near-death experience brought about a spiritual renewal in him while he was recovering, receiving care. And during this time, he wrote a lot of hymns, and including What Child Is This?, at the end of our bulletin today is another hymn that hasn't been reprinted for almost a century, even though some people still sing it. That was one of his, and it speaks to this manger throne of the King of Israel, Jesus, the Son of God. And I invite you to take time following worship to read through that as in a time of reflection. You see, in Jesus' own day, there were many people that they were looking for for Messiah. Messiah, we sometimes just say, well, that's the Savior. But actually, Messiah is a Hebrew word that means anointed. An anointed one, just like King David, who was a shepherd boy, the youngest of seven, was anointed to be king of Israel, chosen by God. And the first one in Scripture specifically referred to as Messiah was a foreign king who allowed the people of Israel to return from their exile and to go back into the land. Now you think about what it means to be a nation. First they're slaves in Egypt, then they're sent into exile, and then they keep coming home. What it means to hold together when they cannot be physically in place in the place they call home. I think the church can relate to that right now. We are a people in exile from one another, but we are held together in this messianic figure and the person of Jesus was cause us to be a community. But unfortunately, the religious experts of the day, the Pharisees, the teachers, the pastors, the clergy, um, even the political leaders and the Jewish zealots, those who wanted to overthrow Rome, people like Judas Iscariot, they tried and failed to set up messianic, you know, Messiah or messianic figure. 
And the Gospels point out time and again it's because they failed to recognize the signs, though the truth was right in front of them. That even happened to Pontius Pilate. The truth stands right before us, and we miss the mark. Literally the definition of sin. We miss the mark. We miss the kingdom of God that is coming near, that is breaking in among us. But it wasn't the religious establishment who readily picked up on Jesus, even though some of them did, people like Nicodemus. But Mary, the mother of Jesus, was the first disciple. Her kinswoman Elizabeth sees what God is doing and understands it. And today in our lesson we have Peter, the one who says, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Savior, Deliverer. You know, we have many names, many titles. The Bible has 198, as I shared earlier. But literally, this Messiah is the one anointed and called by God, but the one who will reign forever and ever. This is the Jesus who heals the foreign woman, the Syrophoenician woman, the woman who is hemorrhaging. This is the Jesus who reaches out beyond his own people and he affirms the faith of the Roman centurion whose servant is healed. Time and again, it's someone from the outside or the outcast or on the edges of society. It's the widows and the orphans who can perceive Messiah when those of us, people like me, people like you, who are right in the center of things, who think they've got it all together, who don't recognize what should be obvious. Peter, for all his mistakes and all the times he's sort of criticized or seems to be put behind, in the moment when he's asked, who do you say that I am? Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, he gets the answer right. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And we've given up everything to follow you. You are the one we call to follow what does Messiah look like if we don't have 2020 hindsight? And I'm not talking about the year that that hindsight will come when we will look at the errors and choices we've made this year. The Jews looked for the rebuilding of the temple, the bringing about of the ending of war, a way of uniting all people regardless of the differences in religion and culture, to bring a true clear awareness of God to all people, signal the end of the world as we know it. For us in the church, the body of Christ, Jesus did these things already. He himself was the temple being renewed. But those who were sure they had the answers couldn't see what was right in front of them. We have a phrase that appears to have originated with George Eliot, a, a pseudonym uh, for the writer Marianne Evans in her book, Mill on the Floss. And one of her characters uses this expression in discussing Daniel Defoe's The History of the Devil and its fine binding and um, how beautiful it was saying, don't judge a book by its cover. And I think that's appropriate here. Evil in its ways can have a beautiful appearance, but it's really on what's on the inside who would for a moment think in a mean, common hay crib in a small town on the edges of the capital, a place like Bethlehem, Bethlehem would reveal to shepherds and to wise men, foreigners from the east, that the Messiah, the Son of God, had come into the world. Leonardo de Lorenzo writes that the word made flesh is visible with human eyes and senses, but the Messiah, the Song of God, Son of God, is discerned only in our faith. Jesus hands himself over to us. The first act of handing over comes in De Lorenzo's words. The word becomes flesh and dwell among us so we could behold him, literally hold him. He asks those first two followers what they're seeking. People like uh, Peter and Andrew and the sons of Zebedee and he asks the soldiers in the garden when they come to arrest him who are you seeking 
he asked Mary outside the tomb, Whom do you seek? And it's the word who was in the beginning and who comes into the world to save the world, who humbles himself before our response. How will we receive Jesus, this child born in a stable? Who do we say this person is? What child is this? This requires the death of our expectations and movement to a new reality so that we can also say with Peter, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. What child is this? It's Jesus. Amen. I invite you to join me now in our affirmation of faith as we have received with thanksgiving God's word to us. Let us say together, and one of our technical difficulties, using the words of the Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified dead and buried he descended into hell the third day he rose again from the dead he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you now to come to the table from north and south and east and west. All those who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are invited to this table to share in this meal. For great is the mystery of our faith. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. It, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We remember that God's Son, Jesus, healed the sick and restored sight to the blind. He welcomed strangers, and he ate with the outcasts. Dying on the cross, he saved us from our sins. Today, we remember this great mystery as we tell of the good news of Jesus Christ. Won't you join me in prayer? God Most High, we give thanks that your son Jesus, on the night of his arrest, had gathered with his disciples, and he broke bread. And when he took the bread, he blessed it and then broke it and shared it with them, saying, This is my body given for you. Take this and eat in remembrance of me. In like manner, he took the cup and he poured wine into it and he held it up and said, This cup is new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And he shared it with them, for it was the cup of the new covenant. Together we come and we ask Holy Spirit to come and be with us and present to us, to unite us, that we may be physically separate in the spiritual harmony, and that is the body of Christ, that we may go into the world to serve. And we pray as we were taught when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ that is broken for us.
the blood of Christ shed for us. Together, brothers and sisters, let us share in the body and blood of Christ and know that we have received forgiveness and we have received life. Let us pray. Lord Most High, we give thanks this day that we have received these gifts from your table to be nourished not only in body, but also in spirit to share the good news, the light of Jesus Christ with all. For we ourselves have been recipients of this gift. And we pray in his name. Amen. At this time, in thanksgiving for these blessings shared with us in Scripture and the Word proclaimed and the opportunity to bring our prayers to God, we dedicate ourselves with our gifts, with our offerings, to support the community of faith and to proclaim the kingdom of God to all we encounter. In his letter to the church in Rome, the Apostle Paul reminds us that we all have gifts to share. When we give, we give generously. When we feel compassion for those in need, we give cheerfully. Let us share what we have to offer to God generously and cheerfully so that God's good work may continue. Let us pray. Lord, bless the gifts that we present to you, that they may be signs of the kingdom coming. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we sing, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I charge you as you go out into this world, when the question is asked, who do you say that I am? What child is this? To confess, this is the Messiah, the living Son of God, for you have received the promise of life in him. And now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May God be kind and gracious unto us. May the Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>